Welcome everybody, thanks very much for coming back. Uh, my name is Robin McClain and I'm the Director of the Publishing Company for the Urban um, We're based in Falmouth in Cornwall, so it's a long way to come and usually I guess we do events in London, but I thought it would be really nice to come and do this on Pete's home territory as Pete always invariably describes himself as not just an independent philosopher, a rare thing in itself, but an independent philosopher from the Northeast. He always specifies that. <laughs> so it's really nice to be here. Thanks to the dog. Um, and of course, we're here to talk about uh, Pete's book, Object Oriented Philosophy, Numenor's New Clothes. Um, and it's Pete's first book, which means for me, I'm even more proud to be publishing it, um, as I think. Everyone I know uh, is united in thinking that Pete is a great philosophical talent and that his work should be out there in the world. Um, as Pete himself says in the preface to the book, as a first book, it's a bit strange because undeniably it's a book which is written against something. It's a critique and it's a long and detailed critique. Um, what is it a critique of? Um, what's become known as object-oriented ontology? and specifically throughout the book, Object-Oriented Philosophy of Graham Harmon, which over the last uh, five years or so has cut an impressive sway, not only in the relatively rarefied and uh, small world of philosophy, but in other disciplines in the humanities where um, its philosophical tenets have been taken up, and um, in the art world as well. Um, I think it's, it's difficult to say in a very brief uh, few words what object-oriented philosophy is and in fact Pete gives an extremely good um, account of it in the book. Um, would you like to say a few words about what it is? What it is? Um, For those who don't know. Um, well, um, I suppose there's, there's, there's two things to be said about it fundamentally. Uh, one is uh, what it positions itself against. Um, so it, to understand it, you have to understand that it, it positions itself against what um, Fred Mayasu calls correlationism, or what Graham Paul himself calls the philosophy of access, which is uh, a, a rough consensus in European philosophy that's spread throughout other parts of academia in the 20th century that says fundamentally uh, our knowledge of the world is uh, limited by the way in which we live. This, this uh, is articulated in various different ways, be it by the idea that fundamentally we can't think outside of the bounds of, of the languages that we know, or, or the particular cultures we're part of, or even uh, the particular kind of biological capacities we have as human beings. There are various different ways of articulating this idea that we're somehow constrained by the modes of access we have to things. So initially, object oriented philosophy is, is posed a, a, a critique and alternative to these philosophies, and it's, it's, it's meant to give a sort of metaphysical account of the nature of reality as it is in itself, outside of our actor. Um, however, the way in which it does this is um, actually by turning a correlationism or philosophy of access into a, a metaphysic. So the 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 essential, essential idea is that it's not simply that we, in our our interactions with things in the world, are constrained by our particular modes of access to them, but that this is a feature of all what he calls relations between objects. So the, the idea is that that. There's, there's a certain sense in which uh, my laptop and the table can never know each other, just as I can never know the laptop and never know itself. This is why the, the book is called the, the Newman and New Clothes, insofar as this idea with the thing in itself, beyond their access to it, um, was, was called the Newman and Kant's philosophy. Essentially, what, what Harmon's work does is to, to generalize this, but to claim that in generalizing it, it is actually told us something about the world as it is in, is in itself. Um, there's there's so, various other aspects to it, but that's the, that's the core. So one of the major claims that seems to have a great appeal to, 
let's say, of previous generation of philosophers, um, certainly in continental philosophy and in humanities, is the idea that for too long the subject has been the centre of philosophy and the relation between the subject and the object has been the focus. And in fact, we ought to also speak about the relation between objects and objects, and that the relation between the human subject and the objects and learning is only uh, a specific type of relation which is um, which is not anything special. And uh, um, to build a metaphysics of objects around this turns out to be a rather intriguing uh, project because counterintuitive uh, conclusions arise, such as the idea that, um, as people say, objects can never really know each other, that there's no direct causality between objects. And um, Peter, I think, does a good job of laying out these um, intriguing and uh, certainly on the surface very compelling uh, arguments which come up with object philosophy. But um, the interesting thing for me is that the book, for me, I think, I think about it more as a book about what it means to do philosophy ultimately, and a book about how ideas gain momentum in the world, and the fact that those two things aren't necessarily the same. And it seems to me like throughout the book, we're trying to work out a kind of puzzle which involves um, a delicate balance between the demands of philosophy, the demands that doing philosophy places on us, and the various demands that human beings make of philosophy, what, what human beings want to get out of philosophy. And that seems to be like the centre of the, the whole um, struggle. Like, but... Well, yeah, I mean, um, not to, I mean, I suppose this is, this answer kind of starts at the end of the book and goes forward because it, the, for those who haven't seen the book yet, it, it starts off um, <coughs> just trying to articulate what Armand's um, picture of the world is, the arguments for it, then to kind of dig a bit deeper into the conceptual underpinnings. And then at the end to try and answer the question of, well, if, if it's as flawed as I think it is, why has it become so popular? To answer that question, it's important to start talking about how philosophy works historically and sociologically and, and um, the kinds of, of uh, ways in which people want to use it and how um, Harvard's work fits into that. And the, the, I think the, the two crucial aspects of this are, on the one hand, um, recognising that and I think this is what fundamentally lies behind the popularity of Thomas' work isn't any of the particular arguments he gives for his picture of the world, but rather the fact that it, it combines and makes seemingly consistent certain philosophical prejudices that a lot of people working within continental philosophy or um, I suppose downstream from it already share. One of which, as I say, is this, this sort of correlationist idea that really we can't know anything. Really, we can't do anything in and of itself. We're, we're always going to have to qualify our knowledge in terms of its relation to our particular kind of socio, cultural, biological, whatever position. Um, and, and the other idea, which Robin alluded to, that, um, that nevertheless, um, uh, we are merely one thing in the world amongst others, that actually our picture of the world shouldn't um, put so much importance upon us as subjects and then you try to treat us as 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 equal to everything else and part of what Harlan's view does is to, to to bring these two independently but but often um uh coincidentally popular ideas and to synthesize them um now the, the other side of this is how that synthesis gets deployed and how it is, it is useful um, outside of philosophy. And, and here what you have to see is the, the way in which um, um, uh, philosophies that articulate one or the other of these intuitions have been um, used resources um, within other disciplines, uh, be it literary theory, art theory, architecture, geography, or whatever, 
um, in order to kind of provide the base vocabulary to talk about other things. Yeah, but I guess, I mean, obviously the book as a critique has already caused a certain amount of controversy, and I think one of the questions, and I think it's quite a valid question that's asked is, well, isn't it okay for other disciplines to use philosophy in the way that they find it useful, okay? So, prima facie, I think a lot of people are going to read the book or see your argument as being a kind of disciplinary injunction where um, basically you're trying to uh, say that we need an epistemology in order to do ontology. Okay? We need to go deep into the question of how we know things in order to be able to talk about what things are. Um, but isn't this injunction, uh, you're kind of being very stringent in your definition of what philosophy is. Can you say something about this question of um, kind of discipline of philosophy and what philosophy you think demands of us and why it can't be used in whatever way we find it useful and what we happen to do? Um, well, okay, I mean, first of all, um, there's obviously a sense in which any of us can put forward a certain kind of philosophical viewpoint, you know, particularly when it's a kind of philosophical viewpoint that has applications outside of just your philosophy. Uh, think other people should think what we think. Like when I'm saying that, you know, I take this through, like, yeah, of course, I, 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 I want you to kind of, in some sense, um, abide by the constraints. But, Placing point, but you know, I I don't think that's particularly authoritarian. Uh, the, the 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 question is to what extent I'm trying to use my position as a philosopher, someone who you know, um, if you don't have philosophical training, you come from a different background, um, and you want to, to use philosophy. To what extent I'm trying to use that sort of difference of position to say how people should should engage with philosophy? Well. Um, I think, yes, I am trying to sort of say that certain uses of philosophy are, are problematic. Um, but again, I don't think there's anything authoritarian about that. There's nothing, I'm not trying to stop people from, from doing whatever it is they want to do in their own discipline, but rather to kind of provide a certain kind of, of counsel. And the question is, well, what, what kind of counsel? Is there, and um, I think it's it's all to do with I I, I talk about this this a, a bit more in the book, but um, um, what's happening with Harmon's work, but also with with other work in philosophy, which claims to provide um, so certain metaphysical accounts of the nature of reality that are supposedly useful uh, to to other disciplines. Um, is that they're claiming to provide certain sort of explanatory toolkits, to certain provide you ways of engaging and explaining phenomena that, that you know, you're concerned with, whichever area you're in. And the big claim I'd make is that um, um, these explanatory, ex explanatory toolkits, kind of sets of explanatory concepts provided by men um, are only worthwhile if they place constraints on you. It's, it's, it's from the, the constraints on what you're able to, to, to do in your discipline um, that they're economically worth for. And if, if what a, a you know, metaphysical perspective is giving you is just another way to talk about what, you are, or what you're already talking about, if it's not actually um, uh, causing you to to, to question or, or, or re-articulate things, then it's just cosmetic. Um, the, only, the only value that can be had from any kind of metaphysical perspective is, is, is through trying to um, really change our conception of what it is to explain things within, within various of the disciplines. Um, and ultimately, I think that's not what object-oriented philosophy does. It, it pretends to give us explanatory power, but really, when you look at it in, in detail, it, it's 
it's just cosmetic. So that gives you a kind of guiding thread as to the telemical vector of this. But um, as it kind of sweeps across object oriented philosophy with this kind of scorched earth policy, um, it also um, makes various lengthy and patient engagements with the history of the discipline um, and the contemporary state of the philosophy with a great deal of um, uh, generosity, I think. And it seems ultimately like you end up orienting object oriented philosophy within that history um, and claiming that there is a kind of very singular betrayal of, of that history, which may strike uh, people as a kind of somewhat cruel or unfair. Um, I mean, I, is, is there something very singular and particular about object oriented philosophy? And is that to do with strictly with its content? Is it to do with the contemporary scene and philosophy within it? Um, but where, I, where does it come from? I mean, I, I don't want to say that object oriented philosophy is some kind of world historical event. It's, it's, I don't want to say that it's, it, it, I don't want to present it as say, something like a necessary stage we have to pass through. I, I don't think that. Um, it's more, so it's more like an occasion for you to yeah. get this deeper foray into I, questions. Well I, well, I do think it amplifies certain problems. So, I mean, on the one hand, I think, like, I think in the history of philosophy, there are great mistakes. But, like, there are sort of mistakes that kind of have to be made. Um, so, I, I, I always use Hegel as an example. I think Hegel is an absolutely philosophical giant, fantastically interesting, and I think he's completely wrong um, about many, many things. But, um, but it's, a, it's a brilliant mistake, and learning what's wrong about it drives us forward from uh, I don't think Graham Holman is of the same kind. It's, it's his mistakes, rather than being kind of necessary steps on the road, are rather are, are um, exemplify certain problems that that are um, rife in contemporary philosophy, and that for our current moment in philosophy, it's important that we we, we address and deal with. And in that sense, Graham Hall is just a, a very very convenient way of bringing those things together. And how much do those uh, crucial problems that we need to deal with? with the um, long-standing separation between so-called continental and analytic philosophy because I think most people probably coming to this book are going to be coming to it from the perspective of continental philosophy and maybe you're going to be wary or put off by the fact that you use a lot of analytic philosophy. So how does the work you're doing here relate to that divide which I think over the last decade there's more and more of a consensus that it simply doesn't stand, that it actually stops us from working, that there's a real problem with it, but somehow it's very difficult to overcome. Um, well, I mean, I, I'm on record previously as sort of refusing to identify myself either as a continental philosopher or as an analytic philosopher. I come from a continental philosophy background, but I need to talk about philosophy. And, and basically, I think when it comes to philosophy, we should. Um, Use whatever thinkers and tools are relevant to the, the problems at hand. Um, um, Do you think the distinction even has any substance apart from its history? Well, it, it, it has historical and sociological import, right? It, 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 if, for anybody who has any background in philosophy or who, who, who you know, engages the philosophy community, you can't not recognize the split as corresponding to something. And you can't not, um, and you know, in in reading Graham Thomas' work, you can't not but see it as being a, a certain assertion of um, a, a certain new wave of continental philosophy against that. I mean, it, Thomas' yeah, work very much is is quite explicit in sort of anti analytic where he talks about sort of you know, certain isolated analytic methods. Um, um, and is there a kind of strategic advantage in 
so positioning yourself against analytic philosophy, what does it, what does that kind of negative relation bring in terms of what your are able to do as a self-defined continental philosopher? Well, it, it does give you a certain amount of social traction because the, you know, uh, there is a certain kind of war mentality in, in continental philosophy or a, a punk mentality of continental philosophers being in a genuine, for the most part, um, more precarious institutional position um, tend to feel sort of put upon by another philosophy, challenged by it. Um, and anything which taps into that kind of um, anxiety and angst in challenging analytic philosophy is obviously you get some kind of traction. Um, I think, um, I mean, to talk about the, the, the sociological relation between the two, there's, there's, there's many people who, who've made careers out of attempting to bridge the divide or attempting to, from one side or the other, attack the other, or to, to, to in some way articulate it. I think what my approach to it in, in the book is, is perhaps less um, um, less sexy, really, because I just, I, I, I just, I'm quite happy to deal with the history of both traditions and see how they connect. Yeah. To do the actual work of just going through and seeing how the concepts work. So that's one of the remarkable things in the book is the way you trace. Um, I'm not sure I'd say parallel, but converging. Philosophical concerns in the two traditions and articulate them together, which is very rare to see, I think, uh, and to show how, in a sense, you can see these two apparently very different types of traditions as um, looking for answers to the same fundamental problems. And yet, this sociological fact has somehow turned them in these two different, very different directions uh, and uh, entailed a kind of a set of stylistic and um, I guess uh, thematic choices which then somehow become unable to escape from. Um, it was possibly uh, one of the things I'm proud of in writing the book, particularly the, the latter half of it, um, but also one of the things I was most worried about insofar as taking the slightly less sexy approach as I say to the analytic content of Friday just not talking about it as a divide and just talking about the philosophy um, means you there's the possibility of alienating both sides there's a possibility because you know, I've got one chapter in the book in particular where on the one hand I talk about um, uh, Heidegger uh, and and Heidegger's you know relation to the history of metaphysics and which is you know notoriously difficult and and you know, many people on the analytics side will just think of it as being nonsense. Um, and then, you know, a few pages later, I'm talking about um, um, uh, the nature of quantifier theory, and I have lots of logical symbols and variables and things that people in from a continental background might find quite um, uh, quite alarming. So, you know, there's there's the danger of, of alienating both. But but I genuinely believe that. Actually, these two things aren't incompatible, or you know, um, even talking about f completely separate things. There are genuine conceptual connections between the work that's been done um, in either tradition and the way in which that work is built on itself. Um, I think to your credit, you do a good job of explaining both sides as well. And um, I think one of the things people recognise reading Pete's work is that he believes that. Explanation is a virtue, which is not um, a slogan that we'd always associate with continental philosophy. And perhaps that's one of its greatest failings in recent years. Um, but we've gone kind of uh, quite deep now. Let's come back to the specifics. Okay. And perhaps you could just tell us very briefly the story about how you became so tangled up in this question of object oriented philosophy that you ended up writing a book which you open by saying most of the people who know me have one question for me why are you still writing this book <laughs> uh, so um, yeah okay so um, I think it was 
2009, I decided to write a paper on uh, Graham Harmon's object-oriented philosophy because I felt I'd, I'd kind of stumbled into it a bit and I, I started actually reading Harmon's work and it seemed very problematic to me and it seemed that someone needed to... So the thing is, is for a lot of people, Harmon's work is um, the first exposure they've had to explicit metaphysics. To stuff which is very avowedly metaphysics, because uh, particularly in the continental tradition, metaphysics has been a dirty word for like the latter half of the 20th century. Um, and for someone who has more of a background in the history of metaphysics, a lot of the stuff that, that Harman talks about just seems overly simplistic or a little bit problematic just on the face of it. So I thought, right, I'll I'll write a paper and I'll I'll just kind of lay out the basics of this. And um, uh, I wrote a, an essay plan, um, and uh, a year later, I'd written the first half of the essay, and it was twenty-five thousand words. Uh, and uh, uh, it took another two years to write the for the half of the essay, and it, it's now this big. Uh, Quite an essay. Yeah. So uh, it, it came. It turned into a book, and the the the, the question then really is like, why? Why bother? Why not stop at any point? And, and there are you know various answers that I give, but the 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 thing which genuinely happened, and a lot of people find find odd as an idea, but I defend that this is this is how it worked. Is um, what initially seemed a little bit problematic turned out to be a lot more problematic than I thought it was, and to be be problematic in a much more complicated and intricate way. And it's, it's very easy, and in fact, I think it's the way most people go about things these days, that when you run into something that you disagree with, but that explaining and articulating that disagreement takes a hell of a lot more work than it took the person to even articulate the point you disagree with in the first place, mm -hmm. you just say, oh, there's not enough time. The problem is, is that um, given the sort of increasing ubiquity of Harman's work and how much effort I could see it actually took to really understand what was wrong with it. I, I just thought that it was necessary that someone do it. And in the course of doing it, I did gain a lot from it. You know, having, right. having to work yeah. out what you think are sort of, putting it in, in simple terms, working out why you think this isn't how you go about doing metaphysics is a really good way to work out how you think you should go about going to do metaphysics. Mm -hmm. So one of the things you get out of the book isn't just this sort of, well, what's wrong with Harman, but also a certain kind of positive mm -hmm. sort of, well, if this isn't how things should be done, how should we think about yeah. it? I mean, then this is also ultimately the question of what you've got out of it. Because when you read the preface and you, you're talking about this whole process, which you've just um, given the, the narrative of, it reminded me of of this thing that Deleuze says about how all the great questions which unfold into philosophies are always kind of like an anguished cry. Um, but what comes out really clearly in the book is there's this weird kind of transmutation where the frustration and the uh, apparently rewardless hard work actually yields a great deal of rewarding insights. Um, all of which go towards this thinking through of, yeah, what, what is the methodology of philosophy? How do we do philosophy? So in the end, although it kind of, in a sense, it reads like a cautionary tale, um, it's also really interesting to see what comes out of it that's positive for you, because I, don't, I think it's probably right to say you're not the same philosopher you were when you began this, this process and that you've, you've drawn something from it yourself. Right? Oh, it's 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 forced me to be a lot more precise at a number of things than than I ever. I mean, I, you know, I, I many of the views I had before I wrote the book are still there, but but precisely the the, the lack of justification and explanation of those views that I kind of attribute to Harmon mm. is precisely what I had to develop yeah. in order to to articulate what happens wrong. I think one of the other virtues of it is the generosity that you had to show in order to do the job and um, part of that comes with this uh, your adoption of um, what Graham Harmon calls the hyperbolic reading. Could you just explain 
um, what that is and how, how you use that. In okay, so um, part, part of the reason the, I had to write the second half after I wrote the initial essay was that I, I promised I was going to do this thing called hyperbolic reading, which is one of Harmon's own ideas. So Harmon's written several books and papers about other philosophers. And he says the best way to disagree with a philosopher um, is to imagine as if they've won all of the arguments. Imagine if, you know, 50 years from now, everybody just basically agrees that they're right. Um, you know, they're the next big figure in philosophy and there's only kind of a few people disagreeing with them. And then you, what you are supposed to do is imagine, well, what will be missing in this world where they've won? Um, what, what are the things that, you know, that wouldn't be kind of properly articulated? What would be the remaining questions to deal with? And, um, I was kind of drawn to the idea of, well, if I'm going to engage with Harman, let's, let's give this hyperbolic reading of his work. Let's turn this on him. Um, but in order to do that, you, you have to be, to do it properly, you've got to be as charitable as possible. Um, and this has been one of the kind of controversies online. Someone, at least one person has accused me of not being charitable. Um, um, because... Um, the, the hyperbolic reading of Harmon I gave is really bleak. Um, <laughs> you know, I think I think the sort of the the, the world fifty years from now in which object oriented philosophy is, is completely won would be uh, dystopian, uh, you know, ideologically apocalyptic. Um, but I had to spend you know three hundred pages or more um, showing the uh, as charitably as possible. The, the nature of Harman's ideas and, and what's wrong with them and why they would lead to, to such a, a kind of bleak situation. So that's like the last part of the book, which gives the book a really interesting structure because you begin with this promise and then both you and the reader have to do some really <laughs> detailed work and then you get to the end and there's this kind of um, explosion at the end of this payoff of... Uh, Okay, now having done this, we're now allowed to look at this hyperbolic reading uh, and really um, evaluate. We, you've already earned the right to evaluate object oriented philosophy in that light. Um, and I think it makes it a really interesting, interesting read, actually. But um, to go back, sorry. So I was just going to say, I mean, if you want to, you say, like, why, why such a long book? And part of it is, you know, I wanted to write that hyperbolic reading. I wanted to, to say genuinely that I thought. Um, you know, a world in which we had nothing but object-oriented philosophy would be would be dystopian, would be pretty horrible. Um, but I don't think I'm entitled to make claims like that unless I've done this kind of work. <laughs> um, and I think I think that's what maybe differentiates me from some other people is mm. I um, I uh, I don't like to make such bold claims unless I've in the, done the due diligence. Uh, I'll just remind anyone who's watching online, we are going to take questions through Twitter with the hashtag uh, o -O 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 objections. Objections with three O's, i say it that way. Um, but I'd just like to go back to uh, this positive aspect of the book and what came out and maybe talk about a couple of the insights that certainly for me stood out. The first one is that you acknowledge early on in the book, which I guess is obvious from the length of the book, but you acknowledge that you're not going to give a knockdown criticism. And that although enumerating all the theses of object-oriented philosophy and picking through them very carefully might seem over the top, um, one of the reasons for that is that there is no one argument that will knock down the whole edifice. And you identify something quite interesting in terms of um, argument, which is that ideas often prevail because their faults are kind of inter there are, there's more than one problem and they're intertwined in a complex way. Uh, and so because no, no um, knockdown criticism can be had, therefore the criticism isn't, um, you know, the work isn't done, essentially. No, it's a, it's a kind of, um, I mean, I imagine some people have explored it in rhetoric, but it's a, it's a rhetorical problem that I've encountered before. I, I think it turns in political debates as much as anything else is that often um, it's it's much easier to refute a position if you've got just one thing that's really wrong with it, if there's just one kind of particular flaw that is the central flaw of it. Because then you, you can condense down the information, you can make the point 
really kind of rhetorically sharp. But if if a position is wrong in a complicated way, in a way where it's it's actually no, it's not just there's not just this wrong. There's these various different aspects of it, and they're so intertwined that you know if you're not one down, you know, three others kind of sort of support that remaining, um, then uh, the amount of effort that, that has to be put into um, to rejecting it or refuting it is, is um, um, well, it's messy. Mm. It's a thing. It's, it's, it's aesthetically not, not very um, uh, palatable. And so people uh, are not as likely to kind of take it on. Which brings us back to that initial question we were asking about um, what's the difference between philosophy and what we'd like to be able to do with philosophy, right? Yeah. Um, but one of the structuring principles of a book following on from that is that you identify different modes of writing that go on in Harmon's work, uh, his, a type of historical narrative, a phenomenological analysis, and metaphysics itself and you spend a lot of time disentangling them and examining them from this methodological perspective as they're used often like in an overlapping way in specific arguments um, but right at the core of uh, object oriented philosophy you uncover some kind of fundamental problems and I guess I mean it would be difficult to give an account in a conversation that does justice to, to your analysis, but the least of these problems seems to be that no one seems to be able to explain what an object is and how we can distinguish the concept of object from any other concept. Um, so could we try to, I don't know, weave our way through this, this question just by examining this, this core claim that everything's an object, all objects withdraw, um, humans are only one object among many, and understanding where this um, this question of the object itself kind of breaks down, uh, and and yet even so, it's an, it continues to be a very compelling um, trope. Well, so the first thing to say is um, it's not just Harman's work that is interested in this this idea of of thinking about all objects or mm. thinking about everything as an object. So there's a bunch of different philosophers who are um, I've grouped them in here under the name ontological liberalism, um, um, who are interested in trying to account for the the sort of reality or nature of of everything that we can possibly think about. So, Harman's quite famous for doing for sort of introducing this idea using what he calls the toilet needs. He says, you know, in philosophy, we've got to be able to account for you know tables, chairs, stock markets, numbers. Uh, Tins of spam, Popeye. Uh, Popeye uh, you know uh, the bad feeling I get. Um, read Graham Holland's books. Uh, <laughs> but you know we've got to be able to catch everything we could possibly talk about. Uh, and um, this turn, as I kind of explained in the book, it turns out to be a lot harder to cash out the initial intuition that A, you can do this, and B, that it's informative um, in any useful way. Um, uh, the reason is um, that essentially you end up having to give an account of what objects are if um, this was a type of object, um, as if this was a, this was a, a type of thing. Mm. Um, and um, any way in which you do this has a tendency to give you the, the resources to then think about things that don't fit under that type. So you can then think about, well, what about the things that don't belong to, or can't constitute, that we can define as not belonging to that type? And I could, I could go into there are some various different, like, actual logical paradoxes um, uh, in the tradition that, that deal with this, but um, um, thank you. Uh, just to kind of show how this goes a little bit awry in Harman's philosophy, it's useful to, um, to say that, okay, so the way he characterizes, the way he says he characterizes every object is in terms of what he calls um, this fourfold structure. 
So you see, there's a distinction between objects and their qualities. So objects are unitary, qualities are many. Um, there's the bottle, and then there's the the, the green of the bottle, or it's the fact that it's covered in paper, or it's a particular shape. Um, and there's also a distinction between the sensual and the real, the things that we have access to and things that we can never know. Um, and this gives you this fourfold distinction between sensual objects and real objects and, and sensual qualities and real qualities. Um, and this is supposed to kind of provide the structure of our encounter with everything in the world from things we can directly experience to things like numbers or fictional entities that we think about. Um, and objects with each other. Yeah, and, and objects with each other because you know, we're just one more object amongst other things. But the, um, the, the weird thing about the way this is articulated is there's a kind of ambivalence between two ways of understanding that difference between sensual objects and real objects. So on the one hand, you could say, well, when he's talking about this distinction between sensual objects and real objects, the object as I encounter it and the object in itself, what we're doing is talking about two sides of the same object. We're talking about two aspects. Um, so we're saying that every object that we encounter has this fourfold structure. This is what is kind of suggested by the title of one of his books, The Quadruple Object. But the other way of reading this is to say that um, uh, what we have here is two distinct objects, the sensual object and the real object, that are somehow connected. So actually, really, every object is, is in one category or the other and is split between its, two, its, its qualities and its unity. Um, and what you realize when you kind of dig deeper into Harman's philosophy is that this ambiguity isn't resolved. In fact, the, um, the ambiguity between the idea of, of these being two aspects and thus this fourfold giving us account of every object and the, the idea that in fact what we have is a world populated by two different kinds of objects, that, that's, that ambiguity actually constitutes the, the, the sort of supposed uh, um, novelty and interest of his, his characterization of, of objects uh, in general. Um, I think. Um, Sorry if I'm going on too long. <laughs> no, we'll just have to um, cut you short before you just go go over the whole book. Yeah, I'll go over the whole book. <laughs> but um, yeah, uh, the, going a bit deeper into that, I think don't we get down to the level where we have to say one can't simply have a philosophy of, of objects without tackling some rather thorny questions about how we know objects and how we talk about objects, i.e. language and epistemology. There's no ontology without epistemology. And this, of course, is where there's a major break, I think, with your work from the at least the popular diffusion of what become known as speculative realism, of which object-oriented philosophy is, I guess, the, the uh, most uh, the leading brand. So speculative realism in its popular form often centers around the claim that we need to somehow get over the, tw the 20th century philosophy's obsession with language and questions of epistemology of how we know and how we articulate knowledge, how we articulate our claims about the world. Um, ultimately, you seem to suggest that what's vaunted here is being a great leap forward or, or out of this mess of language philosophy is actually kind of a dangerous stumbling backwards. No, I, 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 I yes, I think so. Um, I mean, if you wanted to kind of oppose my view in Harmon's, uh, one way of putting it would be to say, earlier I said that there's a certain sense in which Harmon's work is presented as a, a critique of this correlationist philosophy of view of what he calls the philosophy of access. Um, but actually, really, it's sort of like a metaphysical um, recouping of it. It's it's making it into a met like making all of those sort of um, claims about our inability to access things in themselves that come from this obsession with the possibility of knowledge and the way language works in relation to that. All of these concerns, um, uh, making those into a metaphysical claim. I'm almost the other way around. Like my, I, I think we can know things. Um, 
because I think um, when we understand what it is to, to know stuff, it turns out that um, the, the, the very idea of this kind of um, uh, restriction of access doesn't make sense. Mm. But that what that means is that I I think that um, um, metaphysics as this like knowledge of what there is in itself is made possible by epistemology and that kind of that study of of knowledge. We start off we we, we try and understand what knowledge is. And what we realise is that actually yeah we we can know things in themselves. We can start doing sort of uh, metaphysical inquiries into that. Um, uh, it's almost kind of a, a topsy turvy thing. I'll, I'll, I'll take the, the concern with epistemology and philosophy of language, but use it to fight correlationism rather than the other way around. Um, going back to a more sociological level, I guess, one of the positive things that's been claimed, for, particularly for its object oriented uh, variant, is uh, that it, it's been claimed that it's the first philosophical movement to emerge online. It's emerged within a kind of a new kind of community, which I think we all find exciting, and uh, we all find that's a, an interesting thing. Um, but aside from the the advantages and disadvantages of the blog environment itself, which doesn't always make for best place to do philosophy, um, and apart from your philosophical critique, one of some of your most trenchant criticisms of object-oriented philosophy relate to aspects of how it has developed as a social phenomenon and almost a, um, a kind of a gang. <laughs> so let's, I guess we can agree that philosophy, we think philosophy is a collective practice, right? We don't have any, uh, the idea of the philosopher as being this individual hermit anymore. But where, how do you draw practically the dividing lines between philosophy as being a social phenomena and this situation where for me I think like the worst aspects of human nature start to creep in uh, and things become more about protecting territory dividing yourself off and fending off attack um, more about that than about examining and revising philosophical claims so I wondered if you could say something maybe about this kind of sociological aspect and the, like also just the sheer weirdness of speculative realism being in art magazines and being talked about everywhere when no one's really sure what it is but then everyone wants to belong to it well okay I, I suppose um, the first thing I've got to say is uh, anything to do with this sort of sociological aspect of the online mm. sort of history of speculative realism so of course I don't know object speculative realism was this kind of trend that emerged in about 2008 because of a conference that transcript of which Robin published um, uh, and an object oriented philosophy was, was supposed to be a, a species of speculative realism um, and, and really speculative realism was only ever sort of a placeholder name for something that people thought might actually the thought there might be some commonality between four different thinkers and that this might lead to some kind of new philosophical um, movement and and really it, it hasn't but object-oriented philosophy has remained and has remained as the the most visible side of um, what was speculative realism. Um, um, now, part of that process of discovering that there was really no kind of theoretical unity there was this interesting period of a few years where um, Lots of people, myself included, talk these philosophers and their ideas online. Um, and I, I have to say that this was really formative for me. I, I mean, I still have, have my blog and I still have a couple hundred thousand words uh, sitting on it, um, which <laughs> I can probably never publish. But, uh, um, but it, it was incredibly useful and, and the kinds of conversation and the kinds of like interesting philosophical interaction the ideas that were developed there um, were fun I think count in any other kind of institutional academic context um, there was a real kind of ambition um, and a willingness to kind of explore mm. ideas um, 
Now, the question is, why didn't that lead to any kind of more interesting philosophical unity, and and why uh, why did it fall apart, and why are we we here now? One is that um, uh, of the sort of four thinkers who were grouped in speculative realism, uh, there genuinely just wasn't enough in common. And particularly, I, I see and the way I describe it in the book is that Harmon really is the odd man out here. Mm. Um, but the other thing was um, certain kind of bad social dynamics creeped into what was originally a very interesting space of course. Mm. So uh, what, what originally felt a lot more like the the modern equivalent of of sort of the public correspondence of philosophers. If you ever, if you ever studied anyone like Leibniz, almost all of his work is just you know letters sent back and forth. Um, blogging felt like that. It felt like sending kind of interesting thoughts and critiquing and responding in this sort of free and open area into something that became fac factionalized and uh, much more concerned with with trends and fashion. And that coincided with, uh, in many ways, speculative realism becoming a fashion, becoming something that uh, was talked about, um, particularly in the art world. In fact, if you, well, you can't go to the bookshop anymore, but if you look at, uh, at the most recent copy of the Art Review magazine, you'll see that speculative realism rates at 68 in the Power 100. It's gone up in the 13 since It's gone up last 13, year. 13 paces since last year. Um, so the actual drive to turn this into a, a trend independently of any kind of unitary theoretical concerns uh, is, in my view, what actually killed the, the sort of interesting theoretical discussions that I was interested in. And uh, as people will probably know, there's a postscript in the book by Ray Brassy in a way, the autopsy on, yes. the, on the patient. But let's not uh, dwell on this, except to... So just, I was just thinking about how great it would be if Leibniz was on Twitter. Oh, it'd be fantastic. Um, can, you so, imagine, can you imagine Nietzsche on Twitter? <laughs> I don't think I'd, have, I'd be able to follow him. Yeah. Um, so, to just draw this, this um, conversation to a close, because we've got some questions coming in on Twitter, and hopefully some questions in the audience here, and I should tell you, people being very positive and glad that this is happening, and from London to New York to oh, so yeah um, so I'd just like to ask you maybe to briefly say to close this what what the major lessons are to be drawn from this whole misadventure uh, and then I, just one other point which is I guess I've kind of asked you it before but I'd like to in a sense to play devil's advocate to say that a lot of people will be concerned with the book especially given the position that in a sense you've been painted into already by the controversy that's already taken place online um, about the book um, what people will be concerned with maybe is that your advocacy of explicitness and your call for a renewed commitment to philosophical argument and logic will see that as a rejection of anything apart from what people tend to group together in a vague category as linear rational logical, mathematical, operational, colonial thinking. Um, in, in other words, are you a spoiled sport? Or, in words again, to put it more positively, can we draw the lessons out of this misadventure while preserving the virtues of a kind of pluralistic, open, generous um, range of philosophical argument and, and discourse which I think is something that we all want. Well, I think, um, I just think you should reject the idea that um, that upholding the virtue of philosophical argument is somehow inherently anti-pluralistic. Mm. I see the opposite as being the case. Um, I mean, that makes me a bit, um, uh, makes me sound a bit like um, Jürgen Habermas, which some people would take it as an insult, but in this particular case, um, I think it's fine. You know, the, what we want in in all of our intellectual endeavours is is better disagreement. 
uh, you know, it's, it's not about getting rid of disagreement. It's about having high quality disagreement, disagreement which is as productive and as interesting as possible. And when people sort of arbitrarily claim that they can kind of suspend certain uh, principles of explanation or justification because these principles are somehow oppressing them or, or kind of, I, I just, I just think that um, it's it's kind of special pleading. Um, um, and and this is, you know, so if you want to say what the, the takeaway of the book is, um, this kind of comes out of it, is to say that um, metaphysics has been very kind of deeply unpopular, um, in at least in the continental tradition for the latter half of the 20th century, and in the analytic tradition in, in the early half of the 20th century as well. We're only, we're still kind of, um, finding our feet as a, as a discipline. Um, but in doing so, we're rediscovering a whole wealth of kind of arguments and issues that have already been gone over. And it's, it's, it's important that when people are kind of brought back into kind of the fold of metaphysics and develop a, an enthusiasm for metaphysics of the kind that Harman's work and speculative realism has, has, has created, that um, that enthusiasm gets sort of reined in a bit and people get explained to them that actually, you know, a lot of these issues have been thought about before. And, um, you know, th there is a history of debate here and a history of arguments in these areas that are worth kind of looking at and are worth, it's worth not think, not trying to reinvent the wheel too many times. So that's kind of what, what I do in the book is to try and sort of reconnect people who have been convinced that metaphysics is a good thing by by Harman's work that yeah metaphysics still can be a good thing it's just that this particular metaphysics isn't the greatest example of it. Okay and uh, not unrelatedly we have a question here from uh, Odd Hack on Twitter who says uh, what response have you had so far from Graham Harman? Uh, are you at all expecting a proper or even book length response? Um, the only word I've had of response is uh, Harman is supposedly publishing a book, I think called Skirmishes. Uh, it's been pushed back a few times where he intends to engage with critics. And he did say that he would engage with the, the, the paper that this book grew out of. Um, I don't know if he still intends to do that. Um, all of his, a few comments that have been from his direction about the existence of the book haven't been very positive so far. So um, I, I, I honestly don't know what to expect. Um, I um, and, and you know, no one, no one is obliged to respond to anybody else's criticisms. Um, um, though I'd certainly be interested to see him try. Mm -hmm. um, um, Sumia Paralda from Istanbul is enjoying the talk a great deal. I would like to ask, how did your knowledge on the history of metaphysics cause you to suspect the oversimplifications in Harman's work? Um, okay, so um, to make this a little bit more biographical, um, I, I didn't always think that metaphysics was a good thing. Um, and I, I, I still have very particular views on what metaphysics is, why it's okay. But, at one point or another, I subscribed to a, a certain kind of analytic anti-metaphysics from Wittgenstein and a certain kind of continental one. Um, and I was slowly weaned out of that by engaging with um, the work of, of Gilles Deleuze, uh, um, which um, presents uh, an, an interesting account of um, well, an interesting metaphysics which draws on contemporary science and sort of shows that certain ways in which science has, certain tools that science has developed for looking at the world force us to reevaluate our view of the world as a whole, not just sort of piecemeal. Um, and what happened to me after being interested in this was suddenly I realized, well, if if this stuff, if this stuff can be good, why can it be good? <laughs> mm. I wanted, I, I needed to kind of then sort of justify you know, to my previous self and to all of my kind of previous worries about the possibility and value of metaphysics, why this could be good, and uh, that's why I spent my PhD doing. Um, and 
uh, I came across Harmon's work while I was still finishing my PhD. And, and what I discovered there was that whereas I'd spent sort of two or three years working on the question of what metaphysics is and so what what it could do and what the methodology should be for going about it, that Harlan's work addressed none of these questions. That it just went, right, I'm gonna do metaphysics and you know, there was no no methodology whatsoever, pretty much. Um, and so that's the the first warning card is if someone just says, right, we're just gonna do metaphysics again and isn't actually interested in addressing all of these quite substantive criticisms that you know, people were worried about metaphysics for a reason, for various reasons. If you're not willing to, to engage with us, there's going to be problems. Um, so that's the first point. And then, then digging deeper in, looking at particular issues, what I discovered was, so, you know, as, as I said, I'm interested in Deleuze's work. Um, Harmon dismisses Deleuze's work in a very kind of um, simplistic way. In fact, the most detailed uh, he criticizes, uh, point in his work that he criticizes Deleuze is during a fictional monologue in his half sort of philosophy and literature book. Um, and that should kind of, you know, give, give you pause for thought. Um, yeah, what I discovered is there was basically just a lot of flippancy with regard to existing metaphysical debates I was, I was familiar with. So I won't, I won't say any more because I've probably said quite a bit too much of it. We've got two more questions on Twitter, but I just want to reassure the audience in the real world here that we are going to ask for your questions as well. Um, so this is a really good one. This is HD Monkey. He wants to know, has this work done anything to or for your way of being? Oh. Um, so has it changed your life? You want to think about that one? I think it's definitely changed my life, whether it's for the better or for the worse, <laughs> is, a, is a more difficult question. Um, um, I think, as much as anything else, like it, it's, I don't think many people ever get the opportunity to really thoroughly disagree with something. I don't know if anybody else has, has ever had the kind of desire to to, to go, oh, I just want to, you know, really, really understand that person's ideas in depth so I can take them apart. Um, you know, I don't know if anybody else has that kind of perverse desire, but I certainly have had that desire. And it, it's it's nice to have at least once in my life fulfilled it, to have actually, you know, to say, I, I can genuinely, <laughs> if I wanted to, go through someone's whole work and, you know, charitably, and thoroughly critique it. Does it um, make a difference having now done it publicly as well? Would you would you have been as satisfied if you just if you'd done it at home oh, in your bedroom and no one had known about it? No, I don't think <laughs> it's it's nice to have it in in such a beautiful form. I mean, this is a wonderful, <laughs> wonderful with ham sandwiches with yeah. ham sandwiches in front. Um, so no, it's it's um, whether it, it does good things for my reputation is another matter. But um, but I'm I'm pleased to say that. Um, you know, I feel like I've fulfilled a promise to yeah. myself as much as anybody else. So that's good. Okay, one more. Um, your book will undoubtedly be dismissed by some as scientism. <laughs> Do you think there is even such a thing? That's from uh, John F.A. Okay, so to give context to people who won't understand this remark, um, Harmon is very fond of dismissing um, other philosophers, particularly Ray Brassier. Um, the person who wrote the postscript of the book and who's also been associated with speculative realism as being as, as a being engaged in scientism and scientism basically is just a, a pejorative term that means uh giving too much authority to science you know it doesn't actually have any positive content other than saying you know you're too beholden to science you're like licking the boots of of, of, of physicists or, or whatever that that means um i think uh, this book can't reasonably be used as scientism because I don't put forward any positive metaphysics in the book. Um, and I, at no point do I, I mean, I, I do talk about, uh, about science at various points and I do, I do suggest that the, the way that, um, Harman's philosophy 
forces us to think about science is incredibly problematic. Mm. Uh, but I think I think I, I justify those claims um, fairly well. I mean, um, so I suppose what I should say basically is, if it's scientism, then fine. Uh, I I think I give science its due just enough. I don't think I give it too much or too little. Um, Harmon obviously disagrees, but then again, his view is that science science doesn't know anything about the world. It's, I mean, it's it, it, what's quite this is one of the things that's most bizarre about Harmon's work is that um, you know he, he claims to to liberate reality in itself for us, but his picture of how that works is basically ends up saying that science is not literally true that our best science can never ever be literally true metaphysics can be literally true what he's saying can be literally true but at best science can be kind of figurative and i just think you no know, that's, that's um dangerous nonsense but and, um terence blake wants to remind us that the viewers from london to new york include france so hello france hello france and uh i think this is a comment on a question but he says pluralism means more and better argument not less but is it always the same type of argument and language that's needed um it's not always the same type of argument and language that's needed but it always has to be argument so there's, there's going to be disagreement over what argument is but i just you know remind you that even though there can be different kinds of argument they all belong to the same thing mm -hmm. and you can you know you can say stuff is and isn't argument great so any questions from this fabulous audience who have come out on a rainy Friday to uh, to listen to all this no okay well I have another from the, from the, the world oh this one off the world um, Joshua Coma asks is there an aesthetics that fuels your philosophical enterprise um, as baleful as the speculative realist art world seems in light of your book um, so you say some really harsh things about the adoption of speculative realism and object orientedness into not even so much in practice as into the kind of discourse that surrounds contemporary art but um, is there an aesthetics to your own work you've already said it's messy <laughs> and you can't, uh, and you can't help it being messy because of what you're trying to do. I, I think I make, I think I make a lot of aesthetic judgments. Mm -hmm. Meaning, you know, I mean, um, I think when you're confronted with presenting any ideas, you're, you're you're confronted with aesthetic questions. So I think there are definitely aesthetic choices that have shaped the the way in which I've gone about presenting my ideas, both critically and positively. Um, uh, but there's this I do also have certain aesthetic views about um, about the nature of art um, and what's problematic about the relationship between philosophy and art and, mm -hmm. and um, I think I think well and I, I say this in the book I think that object oriented philosophy um, um, exemplifies some of the worst aspects of the way in which philosophy and art can relate to one another. Mm. Um, and that this re results in, so I'll put it, I'll put it in, in, in a different t way that I, I've, I've often described it to other people. Um, when object-oriented object philosophy or ontology became popular, a lot of people started asking questions like, what would an object-oriented ethic look like? What would an object-oriented politics look like? What would an object-oriented geography look like? And you'll, you'll even find conferences, object X. Right? And, and my general answer to this is like nothing. Like for the most part, it, there's just nothing it can give any of those specific disciplines. There's no, nothing specific can come out of it. And the one, but the one exception is art. Like there can be object oriented art. It's just awful art. Um, so it's not just that it gives a bad account of art. It's like it encourages terrible art because it encourages this kind of this this idea of the mystique of everyday things it's like it, it, it encourages people to engage in the kind of the, the duchampian gesture of like placing objects uh within within the gallery context and calling it art um 
uh, independently of anything that actually made that gesture interesting. Um, and what we're left with is it provides a kind of thin justification for what I consider to be some of the most just lazy and uninteresting art there is. Um, so in that sense, I have a, a, a definite kind of aesthetic preference for art that isn't that. Um, <laughs> Questions in the room, right. Yes. Yeah, um, so you confirmed for me in your new center talk um, that you believe that ASU is a metaphysician source and that um, correlationism is still a problematic um, issue in his work in for metaphysics going forward. But my question is about, um, I guess, in relation to Harmon's you know, anti anthropocentric, object oriented interests. Um, how do you how do you still claim to know something as you say we can claim to metaphysically know something and not still be wary of our drive to correlate? Like you know, you know, Spinoza's ethics he talks about taking the attributes of the world as necessary, always, never continue. So where, where do we get out of that drive to correlate or that anthropocentric? You know, well, I mean, my, I suppose the, 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 the point I make here is that I, I don't think we, we break out of the correlation in the way, Mayasu's way of, of posing the problem of correlation is, is as being trapped inside this circle that we've got to find our way out of. We've got to find something that's absolute. It's not relative to our own subject position. And he produces his argument that contingency itself is the thing that's absolutely. Um, but I think the, 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 although I think, as opposed to sort of like, you know, naive realists, I think it's, it's necessary to, to say something about how we can know things, how we can actually understand things in themselves. Um, I don't think that this takes the form of a breaking out of the way thing. I mean, I, I think actually, um, 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 Gabriel Catron actually puts this in the best way because Gabriel Catron basically just describes it as being this process of so if you think that the way in which we represent the world um, uh, always involves conditions of how we represent it to do with like the structure of our language or biology or, or whatever um, and these things can potentially distort the way in which you represent the world. Um, uh, the way Catherine sort of describes it is, however, we can represent these conditions. We can actually understand the conditions of our representation. And we can find the ways in which they distort it. We can, we can discover that, you know, uh, to, you know, to give kind of some fairly classical examples of, from critique that, you know, like, say, you know, bourgeoisie ideology, you know, colors our way of viewing certain social relations or patriarchy or, you know, we, we can see how uh, these things distort and in doing so can, can repair those distortions. Now, that isn't a once and for all thing. It's not like, oh, finally, we've got representative reality. Finally, we've gotten outside of, no, it's just that we can always perpetually engage in that process of, of refining and improving and, and so we're never confronted with some sort of um, limit to our ability to, to know things that is sort of intrinsic that we just can't, can't get out of. But neither do we have to think of it as being some kind of absolute getting outside of that limit. There's just that, I mean, I, I can talk more about that, but <laughs> understanding the structure of that process through which we revise our representations that for me is the sort of the epistemological side of, of articulating, you know, the possibility of metaphysics. Um, um, there's a question from Twitter which is quite uh, kind of related. To that. We have so one I more person in, not, um, in the audience. We definitely so. won't miss the audience. Questions. Okay, but just because it's kind of for those on, I thought okay. I'll ask you. This is from Abe Copland. Um, he says Harmon argues that epistem like Pete want to preserve knowledge as a special kind of relation to the world, quite different from the relations that raindrops and lizards have to the world. For them, 
i.e. epistemists, raindrops know nothing and lizards know very little and some humans are more knowledgeable than others. So the question is, is this a fair characterization of your position? In other words, do you think that some humans know more than raindrops and lizards? And if so, aren't you committed to preserving a special kind of relationship to the world? Um, yes, I'm an <coughs> epistemicist, I think is the, the term Harmon uses. And this is a really weird term because it's, it's like, it's one of those terms which basically means everybody but me, uh, but, but it, it, it attempts to, to dress itself up. Basically what it means is people who think it is possible to know things. Um, which is most people actually. You're a dangerous bunch. Um, and and there's there's not much there's not much in common between you know epistemists to the fact that they're opposed to to kind of radical skeptics. Um, so yeah, I'm 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 an epistemist. The answer is yes. Uh, and but the, the crucial thing, it, it all comes down to what people mean by this this term, like special relation. Like, why well, you think that because like humans can know things and raindrops can't, that somehow humans are special in the world. Well, look, there are many differences between humans and raindrops, right? Which, which differences are the ones that make the human special and which aren't? Like, I, I don't think that, I mean, I think there are people who've made humans metaphysically special in the history of philosophy. You know, if you talk about humans as having an immortal soul that has a kind of certain, um, metaphysical position in the cosmos in terms of its relation to like a creator or things like this. That's an obvious case where you've given humans some kind of metaphysical special status. Saying that, you know, okay, well, I know um, there's a lot of my family in the audience and the table doesn't. I don't think that makes me particularly special. Uh, that's the way it is. Uh, question in the audience. There's one here. Yeah. Um, it's interesting you talking about this so can I just repeat the question for them? Yeah. So the question is, um, do you have the right as a philosopher to speak for other disciplines and whether or not they can make use of object-oriented philosophy or any other philosophy? I mean, frankly, quite clear about Mark. For example, said that Mm. Well, no, it's just, um, I don't speak for those of the disciplines, but I can speak to them. Um, and um, when it comes to the ways in which they, they deploy philosophical concepts, I think I can, I can speak with some authority insofar as that's, that's my training, just as they can speak on behalf of their particular area. When it comes to the opinion about art and bad art, I'll admit that that's just, that's my kind of aesthetic opinion. I think I can give reasons for it. I think most people can give reasons for their aesthetic opinion, but I, I don't take myself to be particularly authoritative there. I simply will own up to thinking that um, uh, much of what goes under the guise of object-oriented art just isn't very good. Um, um, yeah. um, I don't think any authority is absolute here. It's just a matter of, you know, you might want to listen to someone who has training in that particular area. And I, I want to listen to geographers and artists and people in other areas about their own stuff. Following on from this, maybe a brief response, because otherwise we're kind of treading on the toes of the event we're doing next week at Tate. Oh. Launch of aesthetics. But um, Diane Bauer, <clears throat> it's clear, she says it's clear how um, object-oriented philosophy can encourage bad art. But could you say something about where there could be a productive relationship between art and philosophy? Oh God. Okay, um, this is something I, I've been thinking about a lot and I can't say I have a definitive answer. Um, but I, I think it's important to understand that, um, so, um, artists and a lot of stuff, art in the sense of high art, the kind of art that gets you on in galleries and this, that, the artists do um, engage with concepts. Philosophers also engage with concepts. Um, and in that kind of overlapping sphere of engagement, there's a lot of possibility to 
threaten each other's tours and to get confused about what each other is doing. Um, I think that um, 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 it's important to, to, to get clear about the difference between the ways in which philosophers are engaged with concepts and the way in which art, artists are engaged with concepts in order that you can actually have a productive discussion. Um, because you can, on the one side, end up with um, artists um, trying to do philosophy through art, uh, which I think is generally just going to fail. Isn't a certain amount of um, continental philosophy doing the inverse? Yeah, well? <laughs> but you can also get the opposite. You can get philosophers trying to do trying to do art through doing philosophy, and that can be as bad, if not worse. Mm. Uh, trying to draw on a certain kind of aesthetic um, affect or authority, mm. uh, and it um, and another thing is it's, it's not just philosophy and art. Um, so. So you've got philosophy on this this hand and, and art on the other. You also have intermediary of the philosophy of art, mm -hmm. philosophy which tries to engage with and describe what art is. On the other hand, you have art criticism, which is something that very much emerges out of art um, and is related to art as its kind of own internal discourse. Um, and these things have to be kept separate. Like the philosophy of art and art criticism are, are separate. Like I think philosophers should be able and can talk about what art is um, without therefore necessarily having anything remotely like good taste um, and, and, and vice versa. I think you can have fantastic art criticism where art critics don't necessarily have any worked out or you know, well thought through opinion on what art is as, a, as, as an essence or whatever. Um, this isn't to say you can't have productive conversations. I think you know, philosophers art should talk to art critics, and art critics should talk to philosophers. And I think, I think everyone should talk to each other. But um, we have to be kind of aware of the methodological interfaces between those talks. Where, you know, what when we step into one conversation, what's being talked about and what's being done is slightly different from a different conversation. Okay, there's another question in the audience. A few things. Uh, um, Repeatedly, like uh, discourse pluralism, methodology, um, I can seem to be trying to rescue, as it were, or strengthen the philosophical or strengthen the categorization of the philosophical methodology and methodology. At the same time, I think there must be a recognition. When even you presented your talents, you seem to be inviting now with the history of the historiography of philosophy by way of trying to establish what these people are, what they're trying to find, what their methodology is, and then setting it against the whole history of philosophical discourse. And it seems to be a sort of a bit futile, restless of that. Okay. Let me just um, uh, give a quick pricey of the question is whether in your call for uh, stringency and attention to argument and methodology you're in some sense harking back to an ideal of philosophy that's no longer possible, we've gone beyond and that can't be recovered in a world where we're, everyone's interdisciplinary and... Well I think, I think one that's kind of a little bit sociologically inaccurate, at least if you look at academia, where, in fact, this is something that kind of frustrates me, is that philosophy is increasingly specialised. And it's increasingly specialised into things like philosophy of art, philosophy of science, philosophy of language, uh, particular disciplines where where are, are like quite heavily concerned with the methodological interfaces between what the philosophy of is and what 
what the discipline they're talking about is. I don't think that they're always very good. Um, it's something that philosophy of mind is often quite bad at, but um, but some of the the kind of well, I think some of the best philosophy done in um, the contemporary world, say, um, in the philosophy of science, is precisely methodologically clarifying the questions that concern scientists. So actually trying to, trying to provide a certain kind of methodological self-consciousness um, that enhances scientific So when it, the best example is always quantum theory. Like, there's so much crap people say about the implications of quantum physics. Um, um, but there is wonderful, wonderful work in the philosophy of science, people kind of paring this down and saying, look, you, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't think that this has, like, incredible implications for how we think about consciousness or reality. Or, no, it turns out that the implications of the theory are much... They're still interesting. That he is how you should think about. It. Um, um, so I, I actually think that like increasing methodological self consciousness is something that uh, philosophy has become uh, increasingly concerned with. Um, paradoxically, the the specialization that philosophy is engaged in has nevertheless made philosophy less self-conscious with regard to its own methodology <laughs> so the idea of systematic philosophy in which you could do you know all of these different things and kind of link them together has, has become a lot harder to to sell so the, so that's one sense in which methodological self-consciousness has declined but i don't think it's it's to do with the relationship between philosophy and, the, and other disciplines it's very much more about philosophy's own role so putting it in sort of terms that probably too long now, but I think um, philosophy specializes in that kind of methodological self-consciousness. We just need to be methodologically self-conscious about <laughs> methodological self-consciousness. Um, yeah. Okay. Any more questions? Why did Pete? Why does Pete now think metaphysics is worthwhile? Okay, well, um, I I was at one point really, really heavily influenced by um, Ludwig, Ludwig Wittgenstein, and specifically his later work, where um, he's concerned with um, sort of describing. Um, the language games we're actually engaged in. So describing our, our, our use of language, and he he basically thought that that metaphysics was was bumping our heads up against the limits of language, it was was coming across problems that were just problems built into the way in which we talk about things rather than things themselves. Um, and there are certain problems for which this looks actually quite right there are i think wittgenstein is right in that there are certain things that people thought were traditionally metaphysical problems that turn out to be um just issues to do with how we talk about things so uh, to give an example um uh personal identity one of the classic metaphysical problems is what makes a person identical over a, a period of time so that you know say someone loses all their memory either the same person before and afterwards and things like this so you know everything from talk, positing a, an immortal soul to talking about continuity of memory. Things, there's lots of metaphysical debates about this. I, I think this isn't a real metaphysical problem. I think it's just a, a, a matter of how we talk about things. Um, but um, I don't think all metaphysical problems are like that. I think there's a, you can demarcate between the problems that have been handed down throughout the metaphysical tradition and you can, you can demarcate them into the good ones and the bad ones, the real problems and the false problems. Um, so, uh, let's give an example of a good problem. Um, a, a, a good problem would be, say, um, what is time? Right? That's a, I can tell you that's a good problem because it's a problem that really vexes physicists. 
Um, I'm not saying that physicists need philosophers to answer it. I mean, I, I think that um, physicists who are engaged in that stuff are just doing metaphysics. Um, metaphysics is is the the kind of discourse where we're engaged in interpreting the most kind of abstract concepts that structure our worldview. Um, and I think doing that involves talking to scientists generally. Um, but it's what kind of philosophical metaphysicians bring to that conversation is a methodological self-consciousness. So, you know, I I I can't um, give you um, a, a great answer to the question "What is time?" But I can give you um, some good ideas about what it would be to provide an answer to the question. Right? I'm, I think what you know, philosophical metaphysicians bring to the table is clarifying the questions that are at stake. Which is just to say, demarcating the good problems from the bad ones. Um, and you see, so to get together one more example, because I think it's a, it, it's a good example, not from physics. Um, um, we, we, we do talk about essence. We do talk about what things are. Um, it's a kind of category that we, we apply to the world, and that is incredibly useful and important in the way we engage with things. Um, our understanding of, of essence was fundamentally changed by uh, the Darwinian revolution in biology. Talking about what a lion is, or what a, a human being is, uh, had, that whole thing about essence had to change quite radically. So any, any new metaphysics about thinking about the nature of essence has to take those kinds of things on board. Um, it, metaphysics is complicated. It's, it's, it's not something that gets um, finished, really, I don't think. It's just that it, it is a kind of um, discourse why we engage in. We can't help it. That's a great place to end, I think. Great. Thanks very much. It's been a real pleasure talking to you. And once again, I'm very proud to be publishing this book. <laughs> and it's, uh, it's a really fantastic piece of work. And Pete's going to be signing the book with his best byline over here. Um, if anyone who's watching online wants a signed copy, see what we can do. <laughs> Thanks very much for joining us, everyone here and everyone online. And thanks very much to Pete for writing this book and for talking to us tonight. Thanks.